I had a very similar experience with EOC, who uh, sent me with a lot less time than I would call acceptable, a note that I have to prepare a 15 minute speech. But uh, I had the exact opposite experience just now. I couldn't have asked for a better setup for what I'm trying to say. So I, uh, I thank you. I think maybe Maurice beat me into submission, but uh, either way, it's, uh, it, it's very nice. I also would like to point out that uh, all the old media guys are wearing ties, except for Maurice, who is kind of a bridging between old and new, as he just pointed out, and all the new media guys are not wearing ties. <laughs> By the way, I have to correct you, when uh, Matthias will tell you what they are doing in new media, I'm not sure you will call him old media guy. I tell you, this is a very conventional uh, perspective that you're taking. I mean, instead of asking old media people to take off the ties, which is the <laughs> easiest way to seem sexy, I think the new media guys should take a tie and, and wear one. <laughs> we may or may not prepare this one. <laughs> Matia, thank you. It was two C's in one shot. What's conflict and comic? Great. This will have to do. Alright, so uh, I'll, I'll get to my vantage point. So uh, I think a common approach and a, uh, an attractive one when preparing prepared remarks is to review the old before getting to the new one because there's no controversy in the old. So um, I think media companies and consumer media companies in particular can be split into kind of three stages and the previous experience or something that's been going on for almost 100 years can generally be defined on the uh, content and infrastructure side, primarily as having access to financing. It's not something that floats up all that commonly in conversation, but I think it's pretty clear how cable companies, TV companies, anybody who has ever built content for consumers ultimately control distribution through having access to tremendous amounts of money, leverage, being able to uh, therefore control the audience, control distribution, and ultimately control both advertising and subscription prices. The internet fundamentally changed all that. The second stage of media companies and content production can be broadly characterized as uh, companies that create tools. And uh, USC's, uh, I would argue, somewhat unflattering introduction of Slide was actually hammering in the point that we started our company as a tool making company. We wanted to create tools so that people would make their content accessible to their friends and, uh, and, and co-workers or whatever online in the fastest way possible. If you look at Wikipedia, it's a brilliant tool for making encyclopedic information available. It's a tool for others to edit it, etc. Facebook, Twitter, etc. All these systems are fundamentally platforms, tools for content creation and ease of consumption. They do, in fact, create exactly the controversy of the problem that you pointed out. They can be mile wide and uh, an inch thick or thin. Um, reason being, there's so much content, which parenthetically drives things like uh, CPMs or prices of advertising down simply by the overabundance of pages or page views that you wind up in a situation that the consumer has to ultimately make a choice what content they want to consume and without your clear idea of what content is good or not, they wind up essentially snacking, bouncing from page to page, source to source, etc., etc. In fact, there's a uh, sort of controversial behavior that we're seeing in some of our studies. Consumers actually preferring to create content as opposed to consume it because it's easier to say something than uh, find something interesting to read. It's a whole separate topic of discussion, I suspect, which I'm not going to touch on, but it really is happening. Um, another common behavioral uh, change there is the idea of retweeting or rebroadcasting content that you didn't create yourself simply to stand out. It's important to uh, make yourself noticeable and it's hard to create content so it's very easy to just repeat what someone else has already said. So I think today we live in the world of an overabundance of content, tremendous number of content sources, great difficulty of selecting that content for quality and uh, that being the primary result of quantity. And therefore, placing a tremendous amount of value on not as much content as context. The 
easiest way to give an example of that is people tend to come back online to where their friends are. Facebook has done a tremendous job, Twitter has also done a fantastic job of that. When you know there's an audience that wants to hear you speak, when you know that people are talking to you, commenting, rebroadcasting, whatever you have to say, it tends to be more sticky than a one-sided conversation where you go read a blog and never comment and nobody ever speaks to you, or God forbid read an old media source like a newspaper or something like that. So context is rapidly, to me, becoming a more valuable commodity. If you own a site, if you own a conversation as a media company, you're a lot more valuable than owning just a single-sided broadcast source. The next step, and this is where I get to prognosticating that I believe will happen, and um, this is where I'm taking the slide, this is exactly where I believe the evolution of the media market is pushing us. Typically, when you have a meaningful amount of context and still an oversupply of it, you have to create some sort of a system that allows you to value those contexts or value whatever commodity you have an oversupply of. The only way I know how, having spent half my life in a socialist country and watching it fail before my very eyes, and the other half in the capitalist country, which I very much prefer, I think there's plenty of capital left in capitalism as far as I'm concerned, the <laughs> best way to resolve what's valuable and what's not is um, free market. What I think will happen next, in the context of consumer-generated content, that media companies will broadly transition themselves into being marketplaces for content. Consumers create a tremendous amount of content. At the moment, very, very small number of those are actually being compensated for it. However, there is precedent. If you look at Asia and to some extent the West in virtual world, being second life or IMU or some of the products that we operate, there are now nascent economies where people create content for each other, for example, by generating virtual goods in IMU or doing gold mining in World of Warcraft, which is technically legal, but is still extremely common. These people are creating content that is purely digital and getting compensated for it in a form that's purely digital, yet in some cases, there's already a way to take their digital assets and have liquidity in real world currency. Moreover, a large number of people are keeping their online or uh, virtual world currency inside the virtual world to be reinvested in the experience, which suggests that they are valuing compensation they've gotten for content they've created just as well as they would value real dollars or real shekels. I believe this will spread in every form of media, wherever consumer-generated media is happening today. Consumers will be ranked by quality within the context that they've created, and those that consume the content will ultimately be willing to pay, perhaps in very, very small quantities, but as someone who spent a little bit of time on the transactional side of the world as well, I believe microtransactions and all the other off-the-credit barriers to consumer paying for content are going away very, very rapidly. As this happens, the world will change towards a large number of micro and sometimes macro economies where people will get compensated for their ability to write an interesting blog post, create a texture to be used in an avatar, or even simply for retweeting someone's post. Thank you very much.